So let me welcome everyone. Thank you so much for Zooming in today. Um, my name is John Keese. I direct the Office of Peace and Justice here at Loyola University. Uh, we run an annual speaker series, and this is the first of three events uh, this semester. Delighted to have Ray Kelly here uh, to talk about today's topic, policing and racial justice in Baltimore. Um, our events later in the semester, October 8th, we're delighted to be hosting Maria Steven from the United States Institute of Peace. Her talk is entitled, Where People Power Meets Peace Building. So that's October 8th, same time as today, 1215. And then um, on November 10th, uh, also delighted to be hosting Arsalan Suleiman, who is going to be talking about litigating genocide at the International Court of Justice. Uh, again, 1215 PM, all of these uh, via Zoom, and uh, we'll send out some registration links for you to join us for those. Um, Ray Kelly, thank you so much for joining us here. We wish we could host you on campus, but uh, great to be doing this remotely. Um, let me say that there are few people in Baltimore um, who have given more time, more energy, more commitment to the work of community advocacy and police reform than Ray Kelly. Uh, Ray directs the Citizens Policing Project and advocacy organization dedicated to building better community and police relationships in Baltimore. In January 2019, he was appointed the lead community liaison for the consent decree monitoring team. Um, and that team, as we'll talk about at greater length today, is charged with the monitoring the implementation of the consent decree, which emerged out of the Department of Justice report on uh, police, uh, the Baltimore Police Department. Um, in the DOJ investigation. Um, and formerly, he was the CEO of the No Boundaries Coalition. Many people at Loyola know the work of the No Boundaries Coalition. Um, in 2016, Loyola honored uh, the No Boundaries Coalition with its Milch Community Partnership Award. Um, and uh, that group has been uh, uh, celebrated uh, in many ways. Uh, 2018, they were um, the recipients of the Pax Christie International Peace Award. And then Ray Kelly just earlier this year um, was the recipient of the inaugural Archdiocese of Baltimore Faith in Baltimore Award. Um, so um, rightly lauded across the board for wonderful work um, in the community and specifically around police reform. On behalf of everyone at Loyola, Ray, welcome uh, and uh, delighted to be uh, having this time with you to talk about racial justice and policing. Thanks for having me. I definitely have an affinity for Loyola and the way you produce your curriculum. Great. Well, thanks for being with us. I thought we could get started. Um, and, and generally on the format today, I'll, I'm going to start with some questions. And then um, we have some students who have submitted questions and I'll ask those on their behalf. If anyone who's listening in uh, wants to ask a question, there's also a uh, comment box um, and you can enter that in and I'll be looking at that as we go. Um, we have till about 1.30, um, and then we'll wrap up then. Um, Ray, I thought we could start just by hearing a little bit more about your background. You know, tell us where you grew up, uh, your connection to Sandtown, and uh, really how you first got involved in community advocacy and, and development. So I am a lifelong resident of West Baltimore. I'm also a cradle Catholic, so I didn't have a Catholic school education, but my family was very engaged in the Catholic church. And I started my journey in West Baltimore and Reservoir Hill. And when I was five, we moved further west to the Upton community. And when I was eight, I moved to Sandtown and for 45 years, that's been my residence. So, though I did have that church upbringing, like most people in Sandtown, Winchester, there was a constant influence from the streets as well, and I succumbed to that. So I have lived every component that Sandtown, Winchester has to offer. I've used drugs, I've sold drugs, I've been homeless, I've kind of lived the advocacy that I kind of engage in now to, 
to kind of present the perception that change is possible and uh, be a living, breathing symbol of just that change. So the same community that saw me when I was at my worst can now see me now transform into a better person. Mm -hmm. I started my advocacy on public safety just about uh, visibility as a deterrence to crime. So Sandtown, Winchester and the surrounding communities are plagued with open air drug trade. And the one thing I've learned in my own life on the street is criminal activity doesn't want to be witnessed. So we created initiatives to increase resident visibility in those areas by having uh, visibility walks or doing block cleanups and eventually started collaborating with the Western District Police Department. And a uh, little known fact is through that visibility with uh, what we did with Western District and Bishop Madden and his prayer walks and Nick Mosby and his Enough is Enough rallies. In 2014, Western District has the low, had the lowest number of homicides in like 12 years. Wow. So in 2014, there were 21 homicides in Western District and we celebrated it. It was like, that's what collaborative visibility and effort should look like. And the following year, we had the unrest. And we ended that year with 66 homicides mm. in Western District. So that was kind of the catalyst into the need for reestablishing relationships between the Baltimore Police Department and the community. So that kind of initiated my direct engagement with the consent decree. And from there, we started the West Baltimore Commission. We documented the stories of people from West Baltimore that had negative interactions with the police department. We worked in parallel collaboration with the Department of Justice during that process. So we also allowed them to have exposure to the residents of our communities. And we worked in seven communities. So we made sure that they had that access at an informal level. So we had the DOJ in casual clothes and just participating in community events to kind of have that opportunity to talk directly to the impacted population. We drafted a report called Overpoliced Yet Underserved, and that report got international attention and was also referenced multiple times in Baltimore's consent decree. Mm -hmm. And subsequent to that, I was named <clears throat> to the Community Oversight Task Force mandated by the consent decree which kind of made recommendations to the court in Baltimore City on what police accountability and community oversight should look like in Baltimore City. And, and like you said, in 2019, I was appointed to the actual monitoring team as the lead community liaison. And that's where we are today. <laughs> yeah. Ray, what was the initial spark for you at the beginning of your activism? I mean, you know, I, I can make a difference here and I see that change could happen. Um, so for me, it was the disparity. So a hundred years ago, I used to uh, operate a after school literacy program at St. Peter Claver when the school was still open. So it was called the uh, literacy and leadership program and we taught, we helped students improve their literary skills, taught them more how to present. And we had the Father Charles Hall School on campus 
kind of as that feeder for black students. So when we lost the school and we opened that program up more to the public, I kind of saw the disparities not only in different communities, but for me, it was a grave disparity on the other side of the fence. So at the students at Charles Hall, four years old, and they can spell their name, and they're telling you their phone number and their parents' name and all the important information where just on the other side of that fence on Carey Street, there are four-year-old children that can't spell their name and their mother's name is mommy and they don't have that information if something happened where that kind of sparked the importance to making sure that the direct community around St. Peter Claver had equal access to opportunities, education, and that kind of started me advocating for that disenfranchised community. You mentioned St. Peter Claver, where you worship, and you know your faith is obviously important to you. Can you talk about how uh, the faith in informs your work? Well, for me personally, I, I kind of reference the uh, Beatitudes a lot and the Sermon on the Mount. So for me, I feel like the Sermon on the Mount was uh, Jesus directly telling us what we should be doing and that whole concept of being the salt and the light where the salt adds flavor and it brings certain things to your your taste buds it kind of accentuates a certain situation or circumstance so as you said if you take the saltiness out of salt, then what good is it other than melting snow? And then the same is with the light. If you are presented as a light for your community, then you have to shine it. And if this is what the community needs and says, then you have to project that. I'm a firm believer that if you're not changing a situation, then you're complacent in a situation. So Jesus says that we should be feeding the hungry, but as an advocate, I also feel like then we should also be ending hunger. So it's the same with my advocacy for policy. If we know that we're in a racist society, then our work shouldn't be to tolerate and accommodate and learn how to live. The work of a Christian should be undoing racism mm -hmm. because as long as racism is there, then there's that need for that work to abolish it. The same with hunger. As long as there's hunger, there's a need for the charity and the work to feed people. And that takes capacity. And it's the same with the process of social justice. Thank you for that. Um, I wanna, you mentioned some of the work that you've been doing in police reform. And I, I wanna walk back to uh, Freddie Gray. And obviously you were involved in a lot of work uh, prior to that. Um, take us into the reporting that you started to do with the commission the things that you were hearing from community members um, and some of the, the efforts that you were starting to make uh, in response um, to, to that incident. So I think the title of the report kind of summed up the consensus on the ground where there was a community being over-policed and underserved. So when you have a history of this investment in poverty and you have these open air drug markets and high violence, there is that inclination to profile a whole community. 
and that caused a lot of over policing. We had a nationwide effort to be tough on crime, but when you actually live in that community and you get wrapped up in uh, conspiracy charges and things of that nature, then you're kind of forced to kind of do what you can to survive. And it became important to me to do what I could to not only address those root issues, but create a environment of safety so people would be willing to do their part to build that community back up. And what kind of things were you hearing in the report? You mentioned, you know, the report over-policed yet underserved, which as you mentioned, had a huge impact on the subsequent you know, DOJ investigation. I mean, uh, illegal searches are prevalent still in this community. There's still a certain amount of aggressive policing. We can't dismiss the Gun Trace Task Force where there have been people and advocates in West Baltimore that kind of spoke on these issues for years and that was kind of brushed away as, well, you're a part of the criminal element and blah, blah, blah. And then subsequent uh, DOJ investigation, you see all these things still happening within the Baltimore Police Department. And that kind of identifies the culture of corruption and aggressiveness, so to speak, that Baltimore Police Department has kind of been portrayed as by community for decades. Right. Now, for we have some students um, on with us. And um, for those who aren't as familiar with the Department of Justice investigation, would you mind just um, kind of summarizing, you know, what that report exposed and then I'd like to talk about the consent decree process. It's a very interesting way of talking about police reform, and then it'll connect with some issues that have come up in more recent, um, in recent times. So can you summarize a little bit about the Department of Justice report? So the DOJ pretty much outlined uh, decades long practices of racial and what they call in unconstitutional policing practices in Baltimore's black and brown community. Some, some statistical data would be that 84% of the arrest in Baltimore City for discretionary crimes, loitering, trespassing, just petty crimes are black people. So that's 84% of all citywide. Mm -hmm. And 48% of that number happens in two neighborhoods in Baltimore City, which is Sandtown and Upton. And for the people that live there, we know that Pennsylvania Avenue divides Sandtown and Upton, and that's a huge open air drug market. So the statistic data identified directly these unconstitutional practices that kind of perpetuated the situation that we deem as such a problem now in Baltimore City by creating zero tolerance and all of these records being created by cycling people in and out of the criminal justice system. So that was a major focus of identifying how we got to the point where we were in Baltimore City. I think the report itself identified 16 direct components that needed to be improved within the Baltimore Police Department which was, uh, and I can't rattle them all off my brain right now, but things like stop searches and arrests, implicit bias, uh, uh, 
cultural awareness trainings and things of this nature that have never taken place in Baltimore City, as well as all the inadequacies and antiquated technology and all the other issues that are evident and documented that the Baltimore Police Department has. The one thing I am always clear about and try to be transparent about is there's never been a document that changes culture. Mm -hmm. And I think the ultimate objective is to change the culture of the Baltimore Police Department and subsequently changing the definition and culture nationally of the word policing. And the consent decree kind of lays out a chronological and strategic path to how we reach that point. I think it takes work, it takes a lot of community engagement to inform this process so we don't have to constantly revisit it. And it also takes a commitment from our elected officials to make sure we're holding the Baltimore Police Department accountable to what is mandated and not dragging our feet. I personally believe that if and as we transition into a new federal administration, then that sense of urgency that preceded the signing of the consent decree will once again return and everyone will seemingly fall in line to that. Right, and the consent decree, one of the last things the Obama administration um, had to its Department of Justice. Um, so you've mentioned that you've been part of the monitoring team. Um, can you talk a bit about some of the specific reforms that the, the consent decree, you know, the Baltimore Police Department entered into an agreement uh, in the wake of the DOJ findings, committing um, to these court mandated reforms. Those had to do with excessive force uh, training, um, some of the illegal stop searches and arrests. Um, um, can you talk about from your vantage point um, in terms of the specific reforms, the status, you know, how many have been implemented? How is it going? Uh, how is reform faring overall? So let, let me first explain just how this consent decree kind of pans out. And there is a actual public monitoring plan that kind of chronologically puts forth what should happen and give those deadlines to the BPD. So the first year of the consent decrees monitoring plan was dedicated to redrafting policy. So that process is, uh, I'll say intricate to say the least. So the consent decree mandates that every Baltimore police to poli policy is presented to the public for public comment for 30 days to get the public's feedback on what that policy looks like, what it's lacking, how it can be improved. Then that policy is taken back and to the parties of the consent decree, which is the DOJ, the monitoring team, the BPD, and the city's law department to kind of consider and incorporate that community feedback as necessary. Then the consent decree requires that that second draft is put before the public again for another two weeks to get feedback on the incorporated changes. Once that feedback comes back, it goes before all of the parties for a third time, and they agree on the language to be submitted to the court for final approval. So that process was pretty much what constituted the entirety of the first year of the, con uh, the consent decree. I'm not 
positive, but there were like 512 procedural policies that had to be rewritten and go through that process. In, in terms of implementation, what's your overall sense? Um, is this so, going forward? Is, are there obstacles and barriers? So the policy implementation, I mean, drafting piece is completely done. Mm -hmm. The training, the second year of the consent decree focused on drafting the training curriculum, which also go through that very same public comment period scrutiny. So now we're in the third year of the monitoring plan. We entered the third year of the monitoring plan in April amidst the pandemic. So essentially we had a monitoring plan that was approved, but it was approved pre-pandemic. So once the pandemic hit, so BPD was able to satisfy requirements for e-learning, technological advances, and things of that nature, what they weren't able to do was in-person training. So that piece kind of has been delayed because of the pandemic, because of gathering restrictions and things of that nature and just general safety. Right. So outside of those in-person trainings, the consent decree is pretty much on target. So as far as implementation, visible implementation, as far as the monitoring plan initially proposed, we would have seen on the streets the rollout of the community policing plan, which was finalized early this year, in November. Now, because of training restrictions, we're looking at actually seeing results on the streets, maybe February. As far as the actual components and implementation checked off on the checklist for the consent decree, the only thing that's been checked off is the Community Oversight Task Force. So really, even though BPD has been trained on a lot of these policies that rolled out over the past two years until every officer is trained, the box doesn't get checked. So until they are in full compliance, then we as the monitoring team doesn't consider that piece cons completely implemented. Right. So because of the delay and there's still a small portion of BPD officers that need to be trained in person on stop searches and arrests, we can't say they've implemented it. Even though the policy's there, the training's there, the bulk of the department have been approved as being trained in this piece until every officer is trained, then the monitoring team can't say that BPD is in compliance with this mandate. Right. Got a couple of questions coming in on the chat uh, related specifically to the consent decree. I want to go to two of them. Um, one person said, I'm the president of my city neighborhood association involved with two regional congregation based social justice groups. Should we respond to the consent decree proposals? Is it already too late? How can we be effective advocates for reform and participants in the consent decree? And then I want to bring one more in here. This is uh, in response to over policing. Has the consent decree team discussed limiting police response to certain public calls for help? i.e. moving toward alternative responses to armed police response, like community violence interrupters. Uh, maybe we could start with the first one and I'm happy to kind of um, return to the second one. The okay. first one was, should we respond to the dis consent decree proposals? Is it too late? How can we be effective advocates? Well, I think this whole process is contingent upon the community engagement. So the policy and training drafting 
piece is not done. And that's going to be a continual piece. And there's always going to be the need for that community feedback. So we encourage people to get involved with the policies and I'll share a link to the city's transparency website and calendar where you can just check to see which policies are available for public feedback. And definitely you should chime in. You should also reach out directly to the monitoring team if you're seeing a recurring issue with a certain officer or a disregard for your community, you should kind of report that to the monitor so the court can kind of ask DPD. So what's going on here? I have a community member telling me that this is going on and how are we addressing that? Or we heard that this officer is doing this. Is somebody paying attention to him? And in the reverse, if an officer is doing great and they are engaged in the community and they sit down with Miss Williams and have coffee in the morning while they are walking the streets. We want to know about that too, so we can make sure we incorporate those best practices in Baltimore. So all of that feedback, whatever the case may be, is a necessary component to getting this reform process right. And we encourage everyone to kind of way in because this doesn't just affect the impacted communities that prompted the consent decree when we change the way this city is policed we change the way every community is policed mm -hmm. and the whole fight and the focus of these conversations is about equitable treatment of people in these communities and how about the second one? In response to over-policing, has the consent decree team discussed limiting police response to certain public calls for help? And then um, what about alternative responses like community violence interrupters? So the, the consent decree's mandates does not mandate that they kind of assimilate a certain amount of their uh, prowess as the police officers. It's a recommendation. And I think that's been going, an ongoing recommendation from multiple entities outside of the consent decree, as well as the parties, is addressing things like mental health and creating a preemptive response team through the city and not having law enforcement as the first responder to a mental health crisis or a social service issue. I think what we as residents have to promote is the city investing in those alternatives because the consent decree mandates certain investment into the police department. So in the defund the police cry, they are talking about cutting that police budget in half. And we know that over 70% of the police's budget is salaries and pensions. So if we have a staffing mandate within the consent decree, then we definitely can't cut how many officers we have on the street. The consent decree also requires technology upgrades and things of that nature, training and retraining and uh, incorporation of these new e-learning uh, capacities. And those things cost money. So it's, we, we want to defund the police, but we have to make sure that we're able to fulfill the commitment that we as a city made through the consent decree. And still, we should be investing in those alternatives to law enforcement responding. That's just the common sense avenue to take. 
Yeah, I mentioned we have several students um, on with us and several have submitted questions in advance. Um, a couple of students have read your over-policed yet underserved, underserved uh, report. Uh, one person said, I noticed that the commission did not recommend for a defunding of the uh, Baltimore Police Department, um, which stands in stark opposition to the demands of many recent civil protests. Are you still in favor of restructuring over defunding? We had another question related to the, the, the funding question. With news and resources constantly being circulated since the death of George Floyd, many statements have come out in favor of dismantling the police system. Do you believe in dismantling the current police system or what reforms do you believe are necessary and do you think they would work? So kind of continuing the, the defunding debate. So I, I kind of just spoke on how the consent decree mandates certain investment into BPD. So from Baltimore's perspective, we have to be what's feasible within the constrictions and the mandates of that consent decree. So like I said, we can't cut the police's budget in half. That just can't happen. Personally, I, I am not a proponent for abolishing the police as much as I am of redefining policing. As we all know, policing as we know it in America is a concept adopted post emancipation. And previous to uh, emancipation, law enforcement, and remember that term, law enforcement, was restricted to a sheriff in whom he deputized. So what happened was when we had emancipation and there was these newly released black people, there was a concern that there would be retribution and retaliation for those 300 years of oppression and abuse by those slave owners. So the sheriff needed help to protect the property of those that perpetuated atrocities on this newly freed uh, population and who to control this population but the people that oversaw them on these plantations. So police, by definition, needs to keep clean. So the people that actually police the streets, fixed the holes, and got the rocks out of the road and made sure fence posts were up so slaves wouldn't get away. And after emancipation, you had an abundance of sheriffs deputizing these overseers and the people that kind of took care of the properties to control the black population. And there was created a police officer, which is overseeing and keeping it, the streets clean of these black people. So policing itself is based in racism mm -hmm. and law enforcement should be a completely different concept. So in a community like mine, in West Baltimore, Baltimore City as a whole, we're having 350 homicides a year. We can't enforce the law on gunmen as residents. We wouldn't put ourselves in danger. We're not trained in enforcing those laws. So we have to kind of separate the need for law enforcement from what they call policing as we know it in America. I have another question here. How confident are you that Baltimore police are actually interested in or willing to change their relationship with the community? I see the fraternal order of police president tweeting racist stuff and it really makes me feel hopeless that they're actually willing to gauge in a process of good faith. Am I just being cynical? How can we all get on the same page of redefining policing if the police themselves don't want to be redefined? So another question from one of the uh, folks listening in. So, so what I've learned in so many years of doing this work is 
not only is the FOP not really a reflection of the current DPD structure, but the head of the FOP kind of tweaks and speaks on his own without really taking that consensus of what the uh, actual feet on the street officers have to say. So for me as a longtime police reform advocate, I feel like every fight that we've gone for policy change, reform, has ended in a battle with the FOP. And one thing we all should know is the FOP does not have a pony in this whole consent decree race. And all they have is the influence of their tweets and their recognition as the quote unquote union that represents Baltimore police. They don't represent the department as a whole in any way. They represent individual officers that sign up to that actual union. So in Baltimore City, as you know, we have a completely new command structure in place over the past year. There's been drastic changes in personnel and operations, and you can just look at the response to the demonstrations and protests of this year as compared to the response to a threat of a demonstration and protest in 2015. So I think there has been a consistent effort within the police department to kind of expose that uh, negative culture and root that out. But that's the first part is you got to get that piece out of there. You got to clean house, so to speak, and start from this new concept of community oriented police. And that process of undoing 50 years of corruption, once again, doesn't happen with the signing of a piece of paper. Thank you for that. Got one viewer who said, deeply appreciate the discussion on the roots of policing in the US, Mr. Kelly. I think that is often missed in these conversations and it is so important. I have another student who's read, uh, again, the uh, report over policed yet underserved. Very impressed with the recommendations that you make in that report that I know inform the current work of the consent decree monitoring team. Um, I'm, I'm guessing the student says they've been difficult, these recommendations to push through whether it's the Maryland General Assembly, the Baltimore Civilian Review Board, or the Department of Justice, uh, or the BDP. With this in mind, here's the question. What has been the most difficult policy initiative to get support from these authorities? In other words, which policy initiative has hit the most roadblocks when it was recommended to be implemented? So I think for, from my perspective, I think the uh, civilian oversight piece is a constant battle because we have this law enforcement officer's bill of rights. And people should know that the consent decree does not supersede state law. So a lot of recommendations like we made with the Civilian Oversight Task Force also require policy or charter changes and they stand as recommendations. So I think the idea of strengthening uh, civilian oversight, having uh, non-sworn personnel on the police trial boards has, has been the most contentious fight. And one of the biggest victories to date is getting voting civilians on those trial boards and actually getting that mechanism going. Another student is asking, what are the best ways to become involved in systemic change? What does the starting point look like for people who want to become involved in change but don't know where to begin? So I think for Baltimore, like I said, we have a path that's carved out and 
we have to comply with as a city. And I think that would be the first step would check in with the monitoring team's website or the city's transparency website and just see where they are in the process. Just a week or two ago, we had the amended third year monitoring plan. So that's like real time of what's gonna happen next and this consent decree and all of that is available to the public. You can just go to bpdmonitor.com and all of those links are right there where you can kind of choose to catch up with the process by looking at past documents or you can jump right to the current calendar and jump in feet first and this process is going to keep moving on. The projected time for implementation of the consent decree on, on signing was five to seven years. In my perception, I think it's going to take up to 10 years to actually be in compliance with all of those mandates. And maybe 10 years after we're in full compliance, there will be just a different culture of policing here. <coughs> Excuse me. Another comment from a, view, a viewer. Thank you very much, Mr. Kelly, for today and all your work in Baltimore. When you work on the ground, are there cities elsewhere that you find can provide helpful, practical models for Baltimore? Definitely. So that's kind of how we figured out these best practices is we went to a uh, Denver and Seattle and even New Orleans and cities that have consent decrees. And we talked to subject matter experts from both sides, both the law enforcement angle as well as the community organizers and the advocates in those cities to find out what pieces work, what pieces are feasible for a Baltimore model and what definitely did not work. We didn't really feel like we had to reinvent the wheel where there were working mechanisms and best practices on all of these components. And we just have to one, cater them to a Baltimore model and then implement them into this whole process. Uh, thinking, you know, about our current moment, we have several uh, comments from students comparing, you know, your get, getting wanting to get your sense of the moment um, around Freddie Gray, and then, you know, after this summer, um, what's your sense of what has most changed? You've, you've alluded to some of this earlier. Um, what opportunities do you think are, are here now that may were weren't there, you know, just a few years ago? Well, I think that there is now along with defund and abolish is a, next, a national cry for actual immediate reforms to policing. I think there's a, the pandemic has kind of created this situation that all of America has to see the recurrence of these injustices in the black communities and these atrocities perpetuated against black people in real time. So we're all in the house. We're pretty much stuck to our computers every day. And you're seeing this repeated misuse of this power that we've been advocating against for decades. And now it's like the country is saying, enough is enough. We're in the midst of a pandemic. We're using, we're losing 200,000 people to this and still black people have to beg for the same equal treatment in their communities from police that they've been asking for now for 50 years. How would you connect uh, police reform with broader systemic changes that are needed? Uh, in other words, you know, what do we need now for racial justice? Well, I, I think that there has been a consistent disinvestment in these black and brown urban communities 
since the civil rights movement. So it's like a, there, there hasn't been atonement, so to speak, by the American government by, for the atrocities that have been committed. So we have to embrace the reason why there is this discourse and have that conversation of how do we overcome, compensate, and move forward from the state that we're in. Another comment from a viewer. Thank you, Mr. Kelly, for taking the time to have this discussion with us. I appreciate your time today and your efforts. Um, one student um, is interested in uh, the, some of the protests this summer and also some of the violence that's happened at these protests. The outcome of these protests has result, resulted in violence against protesters. Do you believe that protesters should stand up for the violent behavior against them or should they continue to peacefully object? So I'm, I'm not positive, but I think we only had uh, three incidents in Baltimore City. So we didn't go the New York model of aggressive enforcement. And even in the strategy meetings, there was a intentional approach to non-physical engagement even before the, pro the protest. So we did have a couple of incidents of just stupidity from officers during the protest in Baltimore City, but they were very minimal. And like I said, there was this collaboration at a lot of protests where you saw officers kneeling with protesters and there were no arrests during the de demonstrations for for any of the protesters outside of those two or three incidents that we saw on social media. Uh, another question from a viewer. Ray, as we face this upcoming election, law enforcement is front and center. In addition to police reform, Sandtown, Winchester, and communities like it need an investment in job opportunities. In your work, do you discuss the value of completing the census and underserved committees and in the importance of voting? So definitely that's, so outside of my role as, <clears throat> as the lead liaison for the monitoring team, I'm also the director of a community organization in Sandtown. And we're, we're focused 100% on community engagement in these processes. As we know with no boundaries, we tripled the vote voter turnout in 2016 in uh, Sandtown, Winchester. And not only do we advocate to make our presence known in every, every avenue, we also advocate for consistent engagement in all of these process from a resident perspective. I know the Citizens Policing Project is working on the commitment to reforming Baltimore. Can you talk briefly about that and some of the recommendations you're making? So the commitment to reform in Baltimore is just 16 uh, principles that we want our newly elected class of representatives to adopt to, one, reinvigorate the urgency that we felt in 2015 and 16 to actually get these reforms done. And it's more of a accountability mechanism. So these are things that we've asked for since the beginning of the uh, consent decree era and have yet to actually see materialize in uh, Baltimore City. and things like diversion programs for youth and uh, a tighter civilian oversight and things of that nature are just common sense principles that we could uh, address in real time. I got to pause for one second. Sure. I'll be, I don't know what's going on here, but someone is actually at my door. <laughs> I'm also going to look at a few more of the comments here in our chat. Um, we have one 
that says, having worked with low-income people who are unfortunately facing mental illness in Baltimore, what kind of figure do you think should be sent instead of the police to handle situations involving these individuals? What kind of figure do you envision? Um, we have another one. Uh, Ray, can you speak on how youth can get involved in the consent decree process? So we'll raise that question with Ray when he gets back. Um, uh, Ray had mentioned the um, different reforms that they're you know, participating in now. Um, there's five um, that he's been trying to draw attention to. Um, these are demands that the ACLU has also raised. Um, the first, allow investigations into all police misconduct to be disclosed under the Maryland Public Information Act, create statutory limits on the use of force by law enforcement, um, repeal the law enforcement officer's bill of rights, which he was just re referring to, give the people of Baltimore City the ability to govern the Baltimore City Police Department. And we may want to return to that. And the fact that the city itself doesn't presently govern the police department. Hey, Ray, we're just going over a few more of the questions that have come in. Um, one, the question's about the role of youth. Uh, wonder if you want to speak about how they can be involved in the consent decree pro process. Um, you want to speak about, about the youth? Yeah, how can uh, the youth get involved in the consent decree process? I want to thank whoever answered that question because next month, proposed release date for the youth interactions policy is October the 13th. So the city is being real intentional with the Baltimore Police Department and incorporating not only youth feedback, but youth input in this policy. So over the next couple of days, there'll be a big push to reinvigorate the uh, Youth Advisory, uh, Public Safety, Youth Public Safety Advisory Commission that kind of got ignited following the unrest, but it died with all the confusion with Baltimore City and the transition of the mayor. So there's going to be an intentional effort to work with the Center for Children's Law and Policy and the Baltimore Police Draft Policy Team. They've just hired a, a new uh, policy and implementation manager at the police department. I met her today and within the next week, there's gonna be a lot of information soliciting youth engagement. So if you wanna send me an email at ray.kelly at bpdmonitor.com, I'll make sure you get on the list to get that information. We're definitely trying to incorporate a youth voice in this process and not just organizations that represent you. So we want to reignite this board that'll be populated by youth that are engaged in different programming around the city. Thank you, Ray. I was hearing uh, that another question had been raised, having worked with low-income people who are unfortunately facing mental illness in Baltimore, what kind of figure do you think should be sent instead of the police to handle situations involving these individuals? What kind of figure do you envision? So, <clears throat> To be honest, Baltimore actually has a mental health trauma response unit here. And I think the key is incorporating that into the police functionality. So right now when you have that type of crisis and you call 911, you're calling for police or an ambulance to respond to a situation that's mental health, where we have to create an 811 or some sort of intermediary mechanism or even a line of questioning from the operator that refers those calls to that different entity. And then the police department are dispatched as backup to that social service agency that's necessary. I think that takes cultural change on both sides. So 
we have to recognize that the police department is law enforcement. So when you're calling the police, you, they're coming to enforce something, be it just control. They're going to enforce control. They're not going to ask for compliance, but so many times before they move to enforcement where we have to recognize as a community that we don't need anything in force, we need assistance. And then we have to train ourselves to not call 911 or the police, but call the necessary agency to respond. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. it's, yeah. it's, uh, like I said, we have to train ourselves as well as train all of our city agencies on how to readdress and how to respond to these types of situations that are outside of our reflex and tradition 50 years or so. Mm -hmm. So this is what we've been groomed and taught to do when a situation is out of control. Thank you, Ray. I was mentioning uh, some of the reforms uh, for the next um, legislative session of the Maryland General Assembly. Um, there have been these five reforms. A lot of community groups have been getting behind. You've mentioned several of them already um, from, you know, investigations into police misconduct being publicly disclosed, limits on the use of force by law enforcement, um, returning to Baltimore City, the ability to govern the Baltimore City Police. Do you want to, again, I think this speaks, uh, throughout all of your activism, I think you've been defined by a real commitment to concrete change. And um, it seems that you have an openness to the legislative process, you know, the actual changes that can be made at the General Assembly. Do you want to speak to some of these efforts that, that you've been promoting recently? So the, the five points come from uh, statewide collaboration with the AC, led by the ACLU. And I, I think there are, uh, for us at Baltimore City, there are two strong pieces that we consistently have asked for, and that is, one, repealing the Law Enforcement Officers Bill of Rights, and second is returning control of the police department to Baltimore City. So since 1860, Baltimore City has actually been, the Baltimore City Police Department has actually been a state agency and we are kind of restricted to policy and procedural changes within the police department in a 90-day legislative session that, to be frank, is inaccessible to the impacted communities that are advocating for these reforms. So that's a big piece of what we advocate for is one, the accessibility of the process for Baltimore City's impacted communities through city control. And of course, I mean, the issues with a law enforcement officer's bill of rights to us have been forever transparent is why would law enforcement need a stronger bill of rights than every other American through the Constitutional Bill of Rights. And the protections, we call them, outlined in the Law Enforcement Officers Bill of Rights kind of impede genuine progress and reform in Baltimore City. Yeah. I have a couple of students who are asking questions about what individual police officers can do. One student asks, what actions do you believe individual police officers should take to help put an end to their role in systemic racism that arises from policing? Obviously, the system of policing is corrupt. So how do you suggest that an officer continue doing their job without perpetuating the racist system? So I think what's key and one of the things that uh, <clears throat> kind of attracted me to the New Orleans policing model was this EPIC program that they're getting ready to uh, launch the trainings for here, which is a peer-to-peer -peer accountability uh, mechanism 
that they use internally with the police department. And for me as a longtime advocate, I, I buy into the idea that before the police officers are going to be accountable to anyone else, they have to be accountable to each other. And this blue wall of silence or whatever they call it has to come down. And the quote unquote good apples have to hold those bad apples accountable. So I, I'm kind of intrigued by the concept of creating that internal accountability and having that being part of the BPD's curriculum as a, to become an officer really is a step forward for me. And that's kind of, I'm optimistic about that approach. Another question on policing generally. Do you think policing actually reduces crime? If not, what is the role of policing? Well, I, we, we go back to, to me, policing is to keep clean and people aren't trash or dirt. So policing has nothing to do with ro reducing crime as much as law enforcement and investigation. So reducing crime takes that relationship between community and the police department. So policing as we know it does not reduce crime. It just assists in enforcing the law. And a lot of times it's a negative influence. It's a negative influence on law enforcement. We have, uh, I've mentioned a lot of Loyola students uh, tuning in today. What would be some of your final, you just have a couple minutes left here. Um, some of your final words to our students about our current moment um, and uh, what they can do. And, and also, you know, as students, I know everyone's remote now, but what it means to be a Loyola student in the city of Baltimore. What's your, your words of wisdom to, to all of them? So I think my first words will be vote. Vote, 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 vote. That's the most important component is using this system that we have to actually change it to a system we want. And that first piece is electing officials and representatives that believe in our ideals and are working for the positive changes that we want to see in our community. I think the second piece would be to get involved. So there is, like I said, multiple opportunities to voice your opinion for the record in this process. And we encourage as many people as possible to get involved with the consent decree in Baltimore. Lastly, I think it's this legislative aspect. Like I said earlier, Baltimore Police Department is a state agency. So even if you don't live in Baltimore City, the residents of Baltimore City needs your advocacy to your representative because even though we're voting for change in Baltimore City, the representatives from Frederick and Washington County and Charles County make that decision for us. And for me, that outlines systemic oppression. So I would encourage everyone to get involved with this process legislatively and create an equitable process for the residents of Baltimore. So Baltimore City is the only municipality in Maryland and probably the country is definitely the only major city in the country that doesn't have local control of their police department. And how can you serve two bosses? So if you're serving the people of Baltimore, then how can you also serve the legislature in the state of Maryland? and vice versa. 
Uh, we have uh, one more comment uh, from someone just on ways to get involved for all those who want to get involved. The consent decree monitoring team has a Facebook and holds open public meetings on Facebook Live where we can comment and they will address them in real time. So another way to get involved. Ray, uh, we're just wrapping up here. I want to give you the final word. Um, any um, final things you want to share with us? Uh, I'm so grateful for the time that you've given us and um, the insight into the whole consent decree and the broader themes of police reform and racial justice. Um, any final words you want to leave us with? So I, I think I just want to reiterate that this is the time to get involved. This is the time to actually realize these changes. And it's going to take your students and this younger generation to actually perpetuate this and carry it over the finish line so we can realize it. I think I said maybe five years ago that if we don't continue to pursue this with a sense of urgency, we'll be revisiting this in five years and almost five years to the date we were revisiting this. So as we go into this next four years and a hopefully a new era of electoral responsibility, we need all of us to make sure that once and for all, the United States represents equity. Mm. Well, Ray, on behalf of everyone listening, on behalf of Loyola and really um, the entire city, just wanna thank you again for everything you've done uh, for racial justice and reform. Um, you provide such a model, all of us, uh, for how concrete change uh, can happen a model of hope and optimism, but also real um, truth telling. Um, and I, I thank you for telling the truth to us today and giving us insight into your work. Um, you've given us multiple ways to get involved. Um, so it now falls on all of us to act on that. Um, so thank you, wishing you all the best with your work going forward. Uh, we're certainly gonna continue to follow you and look forward to ways to, to partner um, into the future. Um, Thank and you, Ray. Feel free to uh, share my information with anyone that wants to get in contact or be involved, and I'll be happy to point them in the right, right direction or help them myself. We'll do that. We'll put it up on our website, and uh, we'll have them have ways to get in touch with you. All right. Ray, Ray Kelly, thank you so much. And thank you to everyone for tuning in. Hope you all have a good rest of the day, and uh, take care. Thank you.